Two and a half thousand years ago, a famous, not so famous now, the great Chinese warrior, Chun Su, Sun Chu, gave us a quote that survived until present day. Keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. What he meant was, make sure you understand your enemies, that way you will be able to either live with them or even defeat them. I'm going to put that quote into its modern context and I'm going to do it in a way that will help us to look at the challenges that face our children today. To do that, I'm going to take you on just a really short walk through my life and it begins here. Now, <clears throat> I spent some years living amongst the grizzly bears of northern Canada, and I can assure you that when you live your life as prey, as I did for those years, you think a lot about the behavioral compromises that you're going to make in order to survive each day. Now, I became very, very good at detection and avoidance of grizzly bears, and mostly that worked. In this particular occasion, it didn't. This bear and I first met when uh, he was actually inside my little caravan. <laughs> I then proceeded to escort him out of the caravan. And this picture is actually taken while he's standing on the path to my toilet. Now, <clears throat> I don't mind telling you, I was totally traumatized by this event. I carried the shotgun to the toilet for the next two weeks. And I was actually thinking it would be really good to bring a grizzly bear here today, and I was going to ask Sheldon to bring one, because I wanted to give you the experience of being utterly traumatized. <laughs> Sheldon said he couldn't do it. Well, I survived the grizzly bears, and I went on to set up a research project and a research program that addressed this relationship here. This is the relationship between endangered species and their introduced predators, something that's very cogent in New Zealand today, but also in many other countries. We simplified that problem down to two quite specific concepts. The first we called the recognition problem, and this bird, it's a South Island robin, he's demonstrating that he really doesn't have it. He does not understand that this stoat is an enemy, but he does see a very convenient perch for foraging, which is exactly what he's doing. The second principle that we came up with was we called the coping problem. Now, what's going on in this picture, in which a cat is threatening a bird, is not what you initially assume. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. The bird is in control. This cat and this bird they know each other because they do this dance every day. They live in an urban environment. That cat is slow, it's fat, and it's neutered. <laughs> it's also highly territorial, and this is important to the bird. The bird knows exactly how far it needs to stay from that cat in order to survive and be safe. The cat because it's territorial, is keeping all of the other cats away. There are no other cats in this garden. That bird is actually in about the safest place that it can be right now. And that's because it understands the threat and it understands the context in which the threat is presenting itself. Biologists call that cat a deer enemy. And the reason it's a deer enemy is because it's a part of the bird's defensive framework. Now, <clears throat> we apply these principles in a number of different conservation contexts. I'll just give you a couple of stories very quickly. Yes, we did teach the robins to understand what a stoat was, made them afraid of the stoat, if you like, and we also asked if we could get that new behavioral skill transferred across to the next generation, and we achieved that as well. No point in having a new behavioral skill if you can't pass it on to your kids, because it will die out with you. So <clears throat> we achieved both of those things. In Australia, the small... The small Australian marsupials are threatened by an, a very dangerous enemy, the introduced fox. And this particular 
uh, small marsupial, there's a wallaby, it's called the crocker. There are about 100 of these individuals left on mainland Australia. There are some more on a couple of offshore islands. We taught them to recognise the fox and be afraid of it. That was cool. But we also wanted to do something completely new. We wanted to give them a behavioural skill that would allow them to cope with the fox if one ever showed up. And we achieved that as well. But they taught us something very important. They taught us that it takes an average of 20 trials spread over three months to learn a new behavioural skill for dealing with an enemy. This is an endangered species. The chances of getting even one additional opportunity to deal with an introduced predator is extremely low. That's why they're endangered. They don't have the opportunity to learn these new behavioural skills, should that possibility arise. Well, <clears throat> I had a change of career. Well, no, I didn't become one of these. Uh, I went to live amongst these people and work amongst these people, and I'm not going to say anything about them except to note that all of those skills that I learned amongst the grizzly bears, very valuable. I needed them all. What I really went for was this. This is a landmine, as you know. There are millions of them scattered across the globe today. And <clears throat> my job was to support the clearance programs in order to try and make them even better than they already were. But there's a small problem. I'm a biologist. I don't know anything about landmines. I don't know anything about explosives, and I don't know anything about working in <coughs> post-war situations. So I was on a very steep learning curve. I did bring some useful skills, but just bought those ones. I had to learn how to operate in this environment, and I can assure you it was pretty scary when I first went in there. Wandering around in a minefield, I don't understand what landmines are, or where they might be, or how you deal with them. But then I had a really valuable insight. I suddenly thought, this isn't a landmine at all. This is a sit and wait predator. Something like a, a, a spider, or um, I don't know, there are other, there are a variety of sit and wait predators. Sit and wait predator. If you know how to deal with predators, you understand sit and wait predators. All you've got to do is detect them and then you're safe. And you know, that insight dramatically changed the way I dealt with operating in this environment. And I stand before you today, I've got all my bits. <laughs> Five years I spent, and you know, that insight made an enormous difference for me. It brought understanding and an ability to cope. Now when you work in post-war situations, of course you work with the local people, you meet many local people, and I'm just going to introduce you to a couple of them right now. This young girl is having her ninth birthday just before the outbreak of the current war in Syria. <clears throat> As you can see in the picture, she lives in a nice house. She's got a supportive family. Uh, she's happy. She's healthy. Presumably, she's looking forward to an exciting year until she turns 10. And here she is at 10. She's in a tent. We don't know where most of her family is. Her mother is there, and we can see that both of them are seriously traumatised. We don't know what she's been through uh, through that year, but we can tell just by looking at her that she's got a serious problem. Now, <clears throat> this young girl was born into a 26-year-long civil war in Angola. The war ended about a year before the picture was taken. You can see she's beautifully dressed, she's clean, her hair is, is done in the local style. But look into her eyes, ladies and gentlemen. What has she seen? Where has she been? She is seriously traumatized. This is what a war zone looks like. Destroyed buildings, trashed infrastructure, ruined environment. And then I went to Christchurch right after the earthquakes. What did I find? Destroyed buildings trashed infrastructure, ruined environment, and traumatized people. Sure looks like a war zone to me, and it felt like a war zone to me as well. There is another war zone that we all live with on a day-to-day -day basis in this country. We call it small town New Zealand. This is Kawarau, and several years ago, Kawarau experienced a spate of teenage suicides. 
Not surprisingly, the local people were highly traumatized. They asked, what can we do? What are we doing wrong? And one of the things they did was this. <coughs> Beautify your environment. It's an absolutely sensible thing to do. But many, many other opportunities present themselves. Certainly, many other agencies became involved. Even the government became involved. And it said, in part stimulated by the events in Kawara, it said, after big job losses, after economic failure in small town, we understand there will be depression and there will be suicide. And what they are offering to do here is bring in the mental health workers. It's a classic example of ambulance at the bottom of the cliff reaction. But at least they're doing something, as are, of course, many other agencies. That stimulated me to go out and search for data about suicide rates in war zones. If I'm going to argue that Kaurau, or small town New Zealand, is a war zone, then we may be able to compare what's going on in war zones with what's going on in places like Christchurch and Kaurau. It turns out that you can't find any data on depression and suicide in war zones, post-war zones because nobody's collecting those sorts of data. However, the US military right now is experiencing a tsunami of suicides. And as you know, the US military is recovering from two wars, one in Iraq, one in Afghanistan. Most of these people are young, and most of them are suffering post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. That's the rate for the US military. What's the rate for young New Zealanders today? There it is, ladies and gentlemen. It is one and a half times higher than what the US military is experiencing today. Now, whatever it is that we're doing, it's not working. And we need to start thinking about doing things in other ways. OK, where do these young people live? They live in places like Kaikoi, up in the far north. Kaikoi is actually quite a scary place. This, I believe this building is a gang building. You know, there's a giant police station only one block from this building. Biggest police station I have seen in any small town in New Zealand. This is Featherston, down in the southern Wairarapa, just north of Wellington. This is a town that's waiting to die. There are boarded up buildings, there's graffiti everywhere, a little bit of scrappy landscaping happens to be in this picture, and nothing much going on. That's the kind of world these young people are living in. What are they experiencing? They're experiencing chronic stress. They're experiencing a failing economy. Distressed parents, collapsing infrastructure, social and cultural isolation. This is a war zone. How do they respond? They respond by withdrawing. They withdraw into gangs. They withdraw into the internet. Neither of those are safe places to go. And also, of course, they're withdrawing into depression and suicide. Now, I don't care if you're living with a dangerous enemy, if you're living in an environmental disaster, if you're living in a failing small town economy, or if you're living in a war zone, the chances are that you're going to end up looking like this. Not all of them do, but many do. I always go back to the animals. The animals always are open about teaching me how to deal with my world. And the animals taught me, if you can recognize the problem, if you can develop a coping strategy, you will understand your enemy and there is a good chance that you will be able to live alongside it or even deal with it effectively. Well, our children are walking down a path that we can only vaguely see. And we often ask about them. How can we protect them from? You know, that's the conservation approach. How do we protect our endangered species? We build fences. We isolate them on offshore islands. We even go out and attack the enemy directly using traps and poisons and, and all of the other things that, that we hear about. The reality is that that approach is probably unsustainable in the conservation context. It's almost certainly unsustainable in this context. What we need to do is give them the skills to recognize that there's an enemy down that path that we can't see and to cope with that enemy once they encounter it. And by the time that event happens, they should be already so skilled 
that it's just a natural process, just like that bird. Ladies and gentlemen, my advice, keep their enemies close.